Hello, hello, hello. This is uh, the Great Johannes speaking. I decided to turn my uh, my streams. This is a live stream. I'm streaming on TikTok, and I'll repost this on my YouTube. Uh, I decided to turn it into a bit of a news show. So I'm just going to read like maybe a dozen or so articles, and then just give my commentary. And that's just to uh, inform myself and everybody else watching about what's going on in the world. You know. Uh, I see the first people coming into the chat already. Uh, feel, feel free to ask some questions as I simply go over the daily news a little bit, yeah? You know, today I was thinking, like, why is Europe so weak? It's because Europe is still very decentralized. The United States has this federated, you know, the federal USA system in place that controls what, you know, to, to a large degree what the states are or are not allowed to do in terms of legislation, right? Whereas... um uh, also, Russia. Russia has many people, right? My, Russia is a very multicultural place. It has like the Chechens and so on, and you have the Siberian people. They're different. And ethnically, you could even divide Russia largely into three groups. Anyway, you could split it into three parts. Uh, and so it is. It is also like uh, a country with many nations. China too has like hundreds of different uh, ethnicities living in China. They have like. Uh, over 400 different dialects that are actually languages, different languages that they rule over. But the thing with Russia, China, USA, they're all quite organized. Right? They're all centralized. They have a central power, Kremlin or Beijing or Washington, right? Now, the Arab world, the Muslim world are also uniting under the OPEC nations, right? The oil producing countries. And then you also have like the African Union that they're building and the European Union, but these are all late to the scene. So the African Union, European Union, and uh, I would say uh, the Arab world, they're late to the scene in terms of empire building, right? It used to be so in the past that countries like France, England, Spain, they were already nations long before the Germanese became a nation. Germany used to consist of many different kinds of uh, princedoms and dukedoms and so on, kingdoms, like, hundreds like oh there were over like 600 different little german nations that became one nation under otto von bismarck the german unifier but very late like in eight in the 1870s or so so the german nation is a very young nation and same uh, the same manner in the same manner the european union is a very young quote-unquote empire right uh the usa was simply kind of started out as as a more powerful place than the EU, than Europeans could ever be because, well, the, the Americans, they speak English. They speak a similar language, well, most of them. Um, they soon had their one flag and they had their anthem and so on, right? Um, this is just something that Europe only recently has developed. Now we have the European flag with the stars, right? And we have... Uh, what else do we have? We have an anthem now. It's Beethoven's Ode to Joy. Okay, great. We're starting to have a European constitution. So you see what they're doing, right? In the EU, they're trying to turn Europe also into one diplomatic unit with a single diplomatic mission. There's talk of a single European military. These things could take ages to do while at the same time, Russia's knocking on our door. The USA is bombing our infrastructure like the Nord Stream pipeline was bombed by them. They're looking at the Turk stream pipeline to take that one out as well. You're absolutely hurting Europe. And now this. Um, so for those of you joining, I'm just turning my uh, my live streams into a little bit of a news show where I just comment on the news so I have something to say, right? To fill, uh, fill up an hour or so. Is that so? Is the USA four times bigger than Europe and has less population, which, which grabs all the resources? I don't know how large the USA is. Uh, I think Europe is about 8% of the global Earth land mass. Uh, so that's quite small. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to go through this article here a little bit. So in Germany, what's going on there? Economically, it's not going well. Uh, since, the, since the bombing of the Nord Stream, the gas price shot up, obviously. And many German companies and enterprises have moved in the, uh, moved operations abroad, for example, to Hungary. Why? Because this is really weird. Hungary accesses gas from the Turk Stream pipeline that runs from Russia through Turkey to Eastern Europe. 
right? So the Nord Stream was bombed, and now German industry that has no longer has access to the cheaper Russian gas, they move their operations, some of their factories, out to Hungary, for example, where they are using the same Russian gas. So this is weird. Huh? So it's, German industry is still tapping into Russian gas by moving its operations to Hungary. It's just, it's just really bizarre. So all these so-called sanctions, you know, on Russia to try to crack Russia, the EU is going to continue doing that because the long-term goal is to bankrupt Russia and to plunder it basically for its resources. They don't want a powerful Russia. It's a threat because Russia always can threaten to take Eastern Europe and perhaps all of Europe, in which case the USA uh, would lose access to the EU markets, right? And Russia would become extremely wealthy and you know, uh, someone writes, no people living in Europe are going to war for their country. Well, some are, like 10% of Dutch people. <laughs> in Eastern Europe, it's more. Uh, but yeah, German, Dutch, French people, yeah, very little people are willing to go to war for their country. Uh, maybe in Europe, the idea of nations is fading out. I'm not saying that I support that. But it looks like fewer and fewer people really care about the country they live in anyway. Um, because of multiculturalism, people stop caring about their culture as well, you know. So, Germany's debt break is breaking its economy. Well, let me just read the first paragraph or so here. Right? So, the recent decision by the German Constitutional Court to block the government's plan to redirect 60 billion euros in unused pandemic funds toward climate-related projects has underscored the growing divisions within Germany's three-party ruling coalition. Moreover, the decision is set to undermine economic growth at a critical moment. Yeah, critical moment in the sense that we're at war with Russia, technically speaking, right? In the broader sense. And all of a sudden, the German economy is breaking down. Might it have something to do with the fact that you bombed the Nord Stream pipeline so the German economy can't have access to cheap gas anymore? I mean, I know Germany also shut down its nuclear reactors Weirdly, it's now getting a lot of electricity from France, and France generates that with nuclear. You know, Poland is going to build a dozen or more nuclear reactors to ramp up its industry, hoping that someday Poland can become uh, Europe's economic motor and overtake Germany, so to speak. And I've, ha I've read about the weirdest idea now. Uh, there's a suggestion that Poland should kind of integrate with Germany, so it becomes one big country, just like what the mustache man <laughs> tried to do. Uh, because they need, uh, in order to withstand the Russians, the NATO people have decided that Germany needs to invest at least a hundred billion dollars in the uh, hundred billion euros in the in its military. Uh, dark age in Europe. Carbon taxes are anti-human. So many strange things happening. It's really like they're they're uh, harvesting the common people or throwing us under a bus just to save the elite interests, right? It's so weird. Like 1% of the richest, the 1% in the world, they, uh, they exhaust just as much uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as, uh, as two-thirds of, of the rest of the world do, yeah. So let me see what this is all about. I think it's a bit of an economic uh, article here, but I think the general trend is that Germany is having trouble funding uh, growth, economic growth. And this is their own fault, really. This is their fault for listening to listening to the Americans, you know. Uh, someone writes, all the people who live in Africa are going to fight for their country. I'm not so sure about that because the African countries, the nations, they were all designed by Europeans. And, and the Africans themselves, they feel much more closely related often to their tribal connections, which often cross all sorts of borders. It's very different. So the Hutus and the Tutsis, for example, they're clans or tribes, whatever you want to call them. But they don't really align with a country, so to speak. So, yeah. so Africa and the Arab world, they have very strong family ties in this sense uh, where their, their loyalty is not necessarily to the country or the nation but rather to the to the clan or 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 their sort of religion or so right uh, 
So here's another article I want to... So I'm going over a couple of articles uh, in case people are watching this. I want to, you know... Justice for Climate Migrants. The title alone to me is a, a red flag. I personally don't really believe in the idea of climate migration. They're saying that, oh, uh, in the, the industrialization of Europeans destroyed the world, and therefore now we have climate change and the migrants have to go somewhere else, and therefore it's Europe's job to pay for that migration. I don't, I don't really agree to this, because um, it isn't true. There's no climate change. It's not real. Not to the extent that it would force hundreds of millions of people to move around. That's just not true. You know, they're using this as an excuse, basically, uh, if you know that in Europe, there's always been talk of the transfer union. It means that Northern Europe pays for Southern Europe and Western Europe pays for Eastern Europe. And now they want to have Europe as a whole to pay to Central Africa, basically, even though we have already been doing that for 100 years now, we've been paying for development aid and so on. You know, we never really saw the returns on that, you know, other than immigration. Yeah, but they tax us. They tax the people in Europe and now they want to pay for the not necessarily the development of Africa, but for moving Africans to Europe and then leaving Africa undeveloped. Just as this is what happened to India. So many so-called smart Indian people moved to the United States, for example, but they left India. They left India, meaning this is called brain drain, right? They leave India in a state of you know lesser development while the USA reaps all the benefits off of using uh, educated minds uh, for its economy. It's a bit of theft in, in one way. It's a form of colonial brain drain is a form of colonialism in the sense that you are you are robbing other nations of their educated class, moving them away, moving them out of their countries. For example, in the Netherlands you have uh, we sometimes need new uh, we need more uh, staff in the hospitals, uh, nurses, for example. And then we're very happy that we get more nurses from Italy, for example. But wait a minute, every nurse from Italy coming to the Netherlands is one leaving Italy, get it? <laughs> and that's, that's so weird is that the richer countries are able to pay more and can absorb, therefore, uh, more migrants, but you're stripping other countries from off of their, uh, of their, uh, of their specialists, of their professionals. Because if you're a nurse in Italy, you can make twice as much in the Netherlands. It's very tempting to leave Italy, but you're leaving Italians behind with less nurses. You know, and this, this in a way is extremely unfair, but no one seems to be bothered by it because people tend to perceive the world in terms of money anyway. And they think of more money is therefore always good. I don't think so. There should be something like a more of a moral reason why you would or would not do something, you know? I got a troll in my uh, in my system. Goodbye. You have to be respectful. So let me read about this. Climate change is expected to displace tens of millions of people by mid-century, especially in the global south. See, this is what I mean. Right? There, I believe this is made up largely. You know, by enhancing international cooperation, we could improve the lives and livelihoods of the displaced and develop sustainable solutions that enable affected communities to rebuild. The displaced, who's displacing them? Soros. Soros is simply giving people money to come to Europe, for example. He's displacing them. Right? It's these NGOs, these leftist NGOs, they are deliberately displacing people. But what for? What's really the end game here? Again, these are people who always pride themselves over the fact that, oh, we're so democratic, we support democracy everywhere. But what they do is never democratic. It's always very hush-hush and secret, veiled in secrecy. They, uh, they, they plan the mass migration of people. They plan building big cities here and there. None of these big changes are ever discussed with the locals who have to suffer the consequences, who have to absorb, uh, have to absorb all the problems, you know? So in recent years, climate change has emerged as one of the leading drivers of migration. I don't believe that at all. They can say that, but is that really true? It sounds made up, you know, it sounds like this is the excuse uh, so that Europeans can't say no, because if you now you if now you oppose immigration, that means you want them to die in a hailstorm or something, right? It's not true, man.
yeah, the IPCC, that's totally not a believable organization anymore. So here, in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America, slow onset climate disasters such as water stress, crop failure, and rising sea levels could displace up to 72 million people by 2050. Uh, you know what I think is really going on? I believe the part about crop failure and water stress, but you know why that is so? It's not because of rising sea levels or climate change. You know what, what is really going on here in these places in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America? Population boom. These places have, ha have seen uh, a very large population growth in the recent past. And duh, that seems to be the reason why this isn't working out. Okay, I had like a, an internet crash or something. My connection fell away. Okay, it seems to be back online. I lost my connection for a bit. Um, I hope it didn't affect the experience too much. So uh, what I, I was what I was saying was I believe that in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and so on, they have had simply um, uh, a massive population boom there, which leads to stresses on, on agriculture and water stress and crop failure. Yeah, I believe all that, but that's not climate change. That's human change. We've seen too many growth, too many births there. In this sense, Europeans for some reason are doing the right thing. You know, Europe is overpopulated. We have like 740 million people in a very small continent. I mentioned earlier that Europe is just about 8% of the Earth land mass, but we have about 15% uh, of the people. So it's we're overpopulated in this sense. Uh, um, but the thing with Europe is European natives, they're not having that many children, which is actually a good thing because this isn't a race to whoever has 100 billion people. You can't feed them anyway. You need to be logical and smart about this. You need to understand that there are limits to population growth, but Europeans have understood this. You know, Europeans are, uh, the natives at least, are declining in numbers. All the weirder and crazier it is that precisely these European nations who should actually be reaping the benefits of reducing their populations are trying, somehow filling the gaps with immigrants and exceeding those gaps. Meaning the, um, in the Netherlands, for example, the migration growth, of, no, sorry, the growth of the population living in the Netherlands was solely due to immigration, whereas the natives were in decline, were shrinking already. Uh, this is a good thing. I never, I, I don't see shrinking as a problem as long as you can defend your nation and actually start reaping the benefits you will get from a reduced population. More space, way cheaper housing. Ah, but this is what the great investors don't want. They put all their money in, in, uh, in real estate, right? If you're rich, if you have a rich father, they will always tell you the same thing. Put your money in real estate because the real estate keeps increasing in value. But this isn't really true. Not anymore. It used to be true, but not anymore. Putting your money in real estate nowadays may simply mean that you're buying, on the uh, buying at the top of the market and now it's going to crash and you won't be able to sell or you have to sell at a massive loss, right? And I think that's already happening in certain places where like real estate, which always used to be the safe bet, is no longer the safe bet. Uh, you know? Well, let's move on to another article. I have a whole, a whole series of articles lined up that I can discuss a little bit here and there. So if people are joining this, I'm, uh, I'm just going over some uh, news articles uh, to keep everybody up to date a little bit. The Rage of the Outsiders with a picture of Geert Wilders, his party, the PVV in the Netherlands, won the elections recently uh, on November 22nd. That's already almost a week ago. Um, he, uh, I, I call him controlled opposition. He does oppose immigration. He does oppose the Islamization, which is all great, right? Uh, but he also ends up making foreign policy decisions in favor of Israel and not necessarily in favor of the Netherlands. That's, that's basically the problem I have with these people here. The far-right populist Geert Wilders' election victory in the Netherlands ref reflects the same sentiment that powered Brexit and Donald Trump's candidacy in 2016. But such outcomes couldn't happen without the cynicism displayed over the past few decades by traditional conservative parties. You know, I don't even believe that, but I don't believe in conservatism anymore. What is conservatism even anyway? You know, I, 
for some time, visited events held by uh, uh, an American conservative think tank or so. And I noticed that they're all the, the people there, they're, they have a lot of good ideas that I support, but in general, they're the same sort of liberal type people who would never really resort to perhaps force, if necessary, to defend your country. They would never want to do that. They, they have the same kind of like laissez-faire attitude to things like ideologically, they are clearly conservative, but in practice, and that's what matters, right? They're not that motivated, in my view. A lot of conservative people, uh, in the end, would simply join the left when it comes to war, right? Meaning they would they would run away, they would hide. That's what I'm trying to explain, you know? I feel that a lot of conservatism and liberalism nowadays is so almost so identical. There's no real, no wonder that they call everybody who is a little bit different, call them an extremist, right? And that's just, that's not really true because the, the extremists, they used to be conservatives 50 years ago. Uh, it's just that the conservatives and the liberals have gotten so close together now that they're almost identical. You know, at least that's my, that's my explanation of this. Let's see if this article has something interesting to offer. Yeah, yeah Geert Wilders, as I said, he does oppose Islamization in Europe and, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, I wonder to what extent he will even be allowed or will be able to do anything about anything in the Netherlands. You know, I doubt it, you know, because the media is far left. You know, all the other parties will still oppose him. And in, in the Netherlands, you often need to work with majorities, right? Just as in many other democracies, right? Uh, so that's just not really going to work out, you know. Well, let's move on to another article. So, making European stra strategic autonomy work. Now, strategic autonomy probably refers to Europe also being more independent from the USA. And that's a sensitive topic. Macron actually spoke about this once after visiting uh, Xi Jinping in China. They, this was around the time of the Nord Stream pipeline bombing by the US. They're, they're throwing Ukraine under the bus for it. They're blaming Ukraine for it. And it says here that Spain is using its EU Council presidency to flesh out the concept of open strategic autonomy with a new detailed blueprint for achieving economic and geopolitical security. Excuse me. Through the, though the document is far from perfect, it promises to advance a debate that Europe urgently needs. I noticed something also in the news earlier that uh, Spain is doing something differently to the Israel-Palestine conflict. They want to support Palestine. In fact, Spain says they want to recognize the Palestinian state, whereas no other, no other European country is willing to do something like that, uh, in my view. So the concept of strategic autonomy has already evolved considerably, originating in the defense sphere it first appeared in, in an official EU document in 2013. It then became a foreign policy principle in the EU's 2016 global strategy before finally extending to the economic realm. So I guess behind the scenes, the European Union is working on more autonomy um, because once you have united all these loose-fitting nations in Europe into a European Union, you haven't quite achieved something like a united Europe yet, of course. But what you have, of course, is... Uh, a Europe that can act more as one block, as one unit. And then you can become more independent from the USA, which is very important to us because countries like, like Elon Musk spoke, uh, spoke about this a while ago. He said like, well, after World War II, America could have conquered any nation they wanted. And he pretended as though they hadn't done that. But of course they had. Of course, the, the Americans actually conquered Germany. They took Western Germany. And by extension now, therefore, they also took, since Germany is still kind of the uh, shadow leader of Europe, Germany took, you know, the U.S. through Germany took basically control over the European Union. We don't like to talk about this. So. The basic idea is that Europeans must be able to live by their own laws and defend their interests without foreign interference or assistance. And that will be the USA. Yet, given the EU's cooperative nature, consensus-based decision-making, and deep economic ties to the rest of the world, external action must strike a delicate balance. It must be multilateral when possible, but unilateral when necessary. 
well, this is something I actually agreed to. So it's not all bad, you know. Europe definitely needs to be able to do all this, as they say, uh, multilateral approach when possible, a unilateral when necessary. But this also means from a European perspective, we're going to have to, ver have to change our attitude toward Russia. We cannot continue to see Russia merely as the enemy that must be destroyed, but rather as a neighbor and partner that must be uh, dealt with, not destroyed. Hello from South Africa. Yeah, greetings. Here's an article titled Putin's Killer Patriotism. Pardoning violent conf convicts might not be a particularly desirable way to get more soldiers onto the battlefield in Ukraine. But for Russian President Vladimir Putin, the alternative would be even worse. Last year's partial mobilization triggered a significant backlash against the Kremlin. Okay, so I guess the story is that Russia does have some trouble recruiting soldiers, but so does Ukraine. Ukraine has to send old men in their 40s and 50s now they're sending women, they're sending young women, they're arresting young men who are trying to flee the country. And also, by the way, don't forget, hello from the USA. Yeah. Uh, don't forget, the uh, many of the Ukrainian young actually successfully left Ukraine anyway. If you look at the uh, demographic tree of uh, the, dem the demographic makeup of Ukraine today, it, it has almost no more young people. They all left. They all left Ukraine. Like anybody aged 15 to 25, a very, very large number of them managed to escape uh, Ukraine because they did not want to die in that war. And now, now the European Union, who has absorbed many of these Ukrainian uh, refugees, is actually slapping a lot of these young men with letters telling them that they have to return to Ukraine or else they may be arrested or so. You know how extreme that is? We've never done that in the history of the modern European Union. We've never really deported immigrants to send them back to war. And that's exactly what the EU is doing now with the Ukrainian migrants. Ukrainian refugees, young men who didn't want to die in that war, who came to Sweden or Germany, for example, they are getting sent back. They are getting deported back to war. You know, how believable is this now when they say, well, oh, we have to absorb African immigrants because they are sad and they're fleeing war, right? But when, when white refugees come out of Ukraine seeking refuge in Europe because they don't want to die in war, we deport them back to make them die in war. You know how, how disturbing, how weird that is? It's just not normal. But anyway, Putin then in Russia seems to have a similar problem. They have also a problem uh, recruiting people. You know, it's been how it's been this so far is that generally, whenever wars break out, they don't send the best first. They send people, they send guys, homeless guys and jobless guys from the countryside. They go first. And then it's the lower class. And then it's the lower middle class. It really works itself up like that. And then, of course, the middle class, they start to complain because they really don't want to send their kids to war, right? They feel too good for that, right? And then the upper classes, they supply maybe the generals and so on, but they generally don't get killed. Um, someone says it's not because they are white. It's because those people will fight instead of European citizens. This doesn't make any sense. The, Euro the Ukrainian white men are fleeing Ukraine because they don't want to fight. And the European Union deports them back to Ukraine to force them to fight. That's unheard of. We've never deported black or brown men back to their countries to make them fight in their wars. This is completely insane what is happening here. All right. I wonder what happened to what really happened to Yevgeny Prigozhin with this Wagner leader because he died in a plane explosion, right? So was he assassinated by the USA or was he assassinated by Ukraine or by uh, or was he assassinated by uh, uh, by the Russians, right? Very very interesting that was. Sadly, I think we'll never really know what happened there. Yeah? So Macron's France is trapped in a cycle of violence. On Monday, this is from the Spectator. I'm just reading some articles this session. On Monday, the spokesman for Emmanuel Macron's government, Olivier Véran, mm -hmm. uh, visited the, uh, the village of Crépol in southeastern France <clears throat> a fortnight ago 
Few people had heard of Cripple, but on the evening of Saturday, 18th November, a gang of youths uh, from an inner city a few miles away gate crashed a village dance. <laughs> Someone sent me a cap. Okay, did that work out? Okay, very funny. <laughs> I saw it on my screen. I didn't know that was even possible. Uh, uh, thank you for sending uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, gift, I suppose. <clears throat> so this this happened right in France. I spoke about this. Uh, I think my video was taken down about it. Every time I try to speak about you know attacks on our people, you know where my videos get taken down. I win the appeals so far. I win most of the appeals, but it's it's nasty that the censorship on TikTok is so extreme. Except on the live version here on live, apparently I can say whatever I want. In the maelstrom of violence that ensued, a 16-year-old local called Thomas was fatally stabbed. Several other young partygoers were wounded, and one eyewitness told reporters their attackers had stormed the venue, vowing to kill a white. They came to kill white people. Yeah. Imagine you have like 20 or so Muslim immigrants living in France. They march to a small town with 400 or 500 inhabitants. They have a folk festival going on, a winter festival, right? And, and then they get killed. They get killed because they were natives, they were locals. Why wouldn't, this is actually, an, it's like a war party, right? It's an, it's an act of war, really. And that's how they should be treated. These attackers are not lone wolves with mental illnesses. No, they said these are uh, combatants, enemy combatants, hostiles, you know? They need to be removed. Uh, Johannes, do you think the right wing parties uh, that claim to support our interests are corrupt? Most of them are, yeah. Like AFD in Germany, the Alternative für Deutschland, uh, that's totally controlled opposition again. And when you vote for them, what you really will get is basically a, a centrist party that will never really do what you what should be done. You know, and that's the problem. They're always, you know, they're always. Uh, I just don't, I don't personally like that when action is needed and then the whole society says, no, no, don't do it, don't act, don't be strong, you know, be quiet, just talk, you know, no, oftentimes I feel action is necessary and, and nobody wants to do it or, or those who want to do it are there, but then the rest of the society somehow tries to stop them from doing what is right, or what is necessary, you know, you know, I like to read this quote. The bitter truth is that few people in France have any confidence left in Macron and his government. Yeah, no shit. France is a far cry from the France of yesteryear. They've lost everything, including their language now. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. Some more people ask me some question, you know. Okay, I got some trolls in my account, and that's just, I'm just tired of that. So I block them. What action would you, would you suggest? Well, what sort of action I'm talking about is, you know, uh, we need to start sending immigrants back. A lot of them. This is simply necessary. Sweden, Sweden and so on, and other countries, they're doing it minimally. Every country does it a little bit, tiny little amounts. of. But we need to make be very clear about what Europe is. Europe is not, cannot, and will never be a dumping ground for other, other, ge uh, ge other regions' surplus populations. This is simply not, not allowed, you know? The reaction of some far-right extremists, possibly inspired but by what had unfolded in Dublin, you know, the stabbing of those poor little children, by our Algerian racist on Thursday evening was to organize a show of strength in the inner city where most of the suspects are from. All right, so in Cripol, there was a backlash from locals. They actually did something. They wanted to do something. Around 100 masked men, presumably natives, right, showed up in romans sur isère on Saturday afternoon, some carrying weapons and all looking for trouble. They reportedly came from across France, drawn south to avenge the death of Thomas. Thomas was the 16-year-old kid that was murdered by, uh, by these you know, Islamic terrorists, really, Islamic combatants living in the heart of France. You know, it's just so sad. I, 
you know, we've seen this here in Kripol. We saw 100, apparently 100 natives uh, wanting to fight back against what is really an Islamic onslaught, you know, uh, Islamic combatants literally out to kill white people. Same in Dublin, you had the Algerian racist who, who, mur who tried to kill a couple of children, right? And of course, there's backlash, but then you notice that uh, every time we natives rise to, rise to the challenge, we, we defend ourselves, we, show, uh, we give a show of force, so to speak, then they want to take away our freedom of speech. Then they want to take away our right to get organized, right? Every, so they're not doing that much to prevent attacks against us, against the majorities. But when the majority rises up, all of a sudden, everybody is able to take away our freedoms of speech, you know? It's just nonsense. Uh, someone writes, there are Russian propaganda that they are pushing immigrants into Sweden from Kaliningrad. Well, maybe they are, you know. I do think uh, Belarusia and, and so on are kind of playing, they're toying with immigrants. But so does Turkey. Turkey also does that. Libya does that. They all threaten Europe with immigrants. And the European response to it is always, to, oh, okay, we'll take all your immigrants. <laughs> what? Why can't we have a strong response? And that's what's necessary. Europe right now looks like a very weak old woman, unable to defend uh, you know, the people. So let me move on. Let me move on. Uh, this article says, Sunak doesn't realize the trouble he's in on immigration. Well, I yeah. am. Do you think this guy is going to do anything about immigration coming into Britain? <clears throat> Rishi Sunak. Let's see. Uh, let's see what this article is about. You know, can't read the whole thing, of course. But, uh, just scanning it a little bit. Oh wow, this is an interesting graph. The annual net migration to the UK. There was actually a negative. Oh, there was emigration all the way through almost 1980 up to 1980. It was basically people were leaving the UK. And then all of a sudden, we, you have this massive influx on a, on a yearly basis for the past 23 or so, 25 years or so. Uh, you really, really had a ton of migration, especially here in the last in the last few years. You almost had six more than half a million immigrants per year. That's insane. That's insane. I guess I can zoom in here as well. Is it, let me zoom in. Yeah. Oh, here you see. So 2020 was or 2020 was one good year, apparently, where it seems to die down. And then all of a sudden, boom, now you have like in 2022, you had like 700,000 migrants just coming in from abroad. Right. These are probably uh, partly from India, Pakistan and where else you have them from North Africa. Right. Africa, Central Africa, you know. Someone writes, Europe doesn't look weak. It looks like a prison which holds in chain, which holds in chains people who would otherwise be, well, strong. Yeah, perhaps so. Yeah. Europe is Europe becoming more like a prison? Then you think that pe Europe is trying to keep people in, and you, they don't want you to leave. <laughs> that's perfect. That's that's one way to see it. Yeah, they're trying to keep you in. Because what might happen if, uh, if uh, say, a good portion of the European middle class decides that they don't like Europe anymore, and if there's another option to go somewhere, they might leave. Yeah, and that's a that's a dangerous thing. Because you're going to lose the people migrating out of Europe are the educated ones, right? The skilled ones. They're the ones leaving. So mass immigration is a strange hill for the Tories to die on. The Tories are Britain's right wingers, right? The right, or well, right, right wing, but right of center wing of the parliament, right? But under this party leader, the cortege is assembling, and the bells are starting to toll. Uh, I like like to learn new words. I don't know what this one means. Maybe no, I can't see it all. All right, oh, it's the same article. I'll skip this one. Yeah. Oh, COVID. I wonder if I can talk about that on the live stream. So the COVID inquiry has unmasked the flaws in trusting the science. Yeah, because the science wasn't really based on science. It was based on what? On really strange insights and I'd say feelings of the ruling classes. 
I made a video about COVID today because there was a, a EU parliamentarian, Marcel de Graaf, a Dutch guy. Uh, he exposed something really shocking. There's a, an organization called the EMA. That's sort of like a European medical authority. They decide what sort of uh, vaccines and so on, medications are allowed on the European market. Right. And they found out the EMA sent a letter to this European parliamentarian uh, explaining that uh, the COVID vaccines were never intended for healthy people, only for people over age 60 and for people with risk factors under age 60. Healthy people who took the jabs actually were at risk of becoming uh, ill because of the vaccinations. So, for example, you can have heart problems like myocarditis and pericarditis. So I made a video today on TikTok simply basically restating what I had heard from the press conference by this EU parliamentarian. Guess what? Video was taken down already. I appealed. So I won. I hope to win the appeal. Well, let me see if I even won it already. Probably not. But it's sad that you can't just even speak about any topics anymore. No, I haven't won the appeal yet, so it's still ongoing. Sometimes it can take weeks before uh, before I win or lose the appeal, right? before they finally decide. Because if you get too many strikes on your TikTok account, your, your, your account will be banned. And then you can appeal the ban, you know, which I've also done many times. Let me, let me read the first part, paragraph here. There is something therapeutic and healing in watching Professor Chris Witte give evidence to the independent public inquiry into the COVID pandemic. The sense of calm emanating from the man, his occasionally Panglossian self-satisfaction, his refusal to become anything more than barely ruffled, even when his interlocutors, interlocutors gently venture forth the suggestion overreaction. The impression one gets, or perhaps is supposed to get, is of a very clever terribly rational man in a world full of thick host scumbags. <laughs> Some people are really good at writing. They write so poetically, very colorful language. Yeah. All right. Well, the thing with COVID is that I'm not vaccinated. I'm glad that the travel restrictions have been lifted, but for the past few years, it was odd that I couldn't really, couldn't really move freely anywhere where I wanted to, but during COVID, I was in the Netherlands and then, of course, I got shut out from society. I was no longer allowed to go to a cafe at some point or even uh, we always had to wear the face masks in the supermarkets and so on. Right. I wasn't allowed to use uh, uh, even to sit outside of a cafe. I, I felt a bit saddened because everybody else took the jabs. Right. I think 90 percent of Dutch people took the COVID, took at least one COVID jab and 10 percent didn't. So I'm, I'm not an exception. There's like 10%. You know? There's almost uh, 1.8 million Dutch people who have not taken the jab. But this possibly includes children as well. So I'm not sure. I think in terms of adults, probably most people took the jab. It, it was really stupid. Uh, you know, let me get rid of them. Someone asks, do you plan on getting rid of mixed people too? Half white, half black. You see how, fear, how afraid they are? They're so afraid, like they see everything in terms of an attack on them. It's not like, you know, they you can't reason them. They're just not reasonable people, you know, it's just sad. <laughs> Someone says he, he's sort of an adult and didn't take the job. Well, well done. Me neither. I didn't take the job. Uh, it's a test of character, isn't it? It's a sort of per certain personality out there that doesn't doesn't allow themselves to be told what to do by something like a government. Because it was really nasty, man. You in the Netherlands, we were actually called insults by our minister of health, who called us uh, crazies, whoppies, uh, but translates into something like crazies. They called us crazies. We were not all right apparently for not taking a jab. And now all of a sudden, all the research that comes out says that we were right. <laughs> You you did the right thing not to take the jabs, man. Yeah, it sucks. Your parents made you take the jab. Yeah, that's bad. But I guess, yeah, you know, I don't approve of that. But I don't approve of that kind of medical coercion, but it's, I wouldn't dare to do that to anybody. A 
COVID inquiry. Let's move on. I, I thought this article was interesting to discuss for a bit. Why are so many teenagers supporting Palestine? There was another article that said that, um, who was it? Borat, the guy who plays Borat, Baron Sasha Cohen from the movie Borat and so on. He, uh, you know, Ali G. And he uh, complained that TikTok was like a, a propaganda tool for, uh, for, uh, for Palestinians. And then TikTok responded and said, well, you know, young people tend to favor Palestine over Israel. So that's just how they are. So now you have this article, you know. Oh, here indeed. TikTok is by far the number one source of news for teenagers. YouTube is next. Instagram third. Studies show that the average teen spends two hours a day glued to their screens and few my age buy or read the newspaper. Right, maybe this is a great rift indeed. Like the old generation was always pro-Zion. Also the Catholics are pro-Zion and the American conservatives and evangelicals, they're all pro-Zionism, right? Pro, Pro-Israel. But then all of a sudden you have other people with other news sources. They see different things and they, they don't believe in this anymore. Though when, when I asked around... I asked people, like, are you for or against Palestine? And they say, well, they don't want to make that decision. They don't, they don't want to be for or against this or that. They just want the crisis to end, which is also a very natural response, right? I think that's also my position. Like, I don't want to uh, favor either Israel versus or, or Palestine. I don't want to be involved in that conflict. I do not want to be the decider. I don't want to side with them. The world isn't about Israel and Palestine. The world should be, if you live in Europe, it should be about Europe. We should be about, you know, how do we protect European interests in the world? That should be our number one concern. Yeah, I rather care about white people, European people, instead of Israel, Palestine. Yeah, we're under attack. We had the attack in Kripal in France. We had the attack in Dublin. We should be talking about this most of the time. We are being attacked by lunatics and terrorists and combatants, foreign combatants. We need to do something about this, you know. What other things do you think are fake behind besides Moon, 9-11 and so on? Uh, can't really think of much right away, but maybe I'll think of something. The scientific worldview, I believe that's just totally made up. I do believe in the scientific method as a way to explore the physical world in terms of chemistry, for example, or biology. But the scientific worldview that says that everything is uh, matter in motion, uh, accelerating toward utopia that's just a socialist fiction it's just not real yeah question everything yeah it was a funny video diversity doesn't include white people yeah exactly the just like that rainbow flag it doesn't include the colors black and white yeah is europe really turning to the far right I do, yeah, okay, Wilders has won. It's like the people are turning right wing, but like I said, they're being captured by what I think is controlled opposition. The votes are being captured. And so that in the end, what you vote for is not what you'll get. Just like with Maloney, the Italians voted for Maloney to close the borders, and during her reign now, she has opened the borders more than ever, uh, flooding Europe with immigrants. So yeah, thank you very much, Maloney. But of course, the Italian people were right to vote right wing. It's just that they didn't get what they wanted. And that's, I really hope that people will start opening their eyes on in this matter, you know, you know. Uh, I had some more. Oh, this one. I spoke about this yesterday at length. Uh, the Dublin riot, the free speech crackdown following the riot. So it goes like this over and over again. Some foreign attacker attacks children or, or people of the majority, such as in Ireland or France, wherever. Then normally the majority, members of the majority, don't do anything. They just allow it to happen. But sometimes, sometimes they actually revolt a little bit, right? Young men go out on the streets and they, they, they riot, f demanding justice, right? And then what happens is the the governing powers then crack down on the majority revolting over a, basically a, a legitimate harm and they, right and they try to try to take our freedom of speech away and that's just so fucking sad you know do you think politicians are puppets and most news is fake in the Netherlands, i can say for the netherlands for example that politicians are largely scripted actors they are fed lines um the people you see 
on TV are not really in power of anything. They are more like managers, but their bosses still tell them what to do. Those bosses are not elected. Thoughts on Guillaume Fai or his archaeofuturism archeo idea? I've heard of Guillaume Fai. I liked some of his articles that I read very long ago when I was uh, in my early 20s. But uh, I generally, maybe if you know more about it, you just tell me. But uh, in general, I, I know very little about Guillaume Fai, but I do kind of, I remember supporting his ideas, that's all. So who are the bosses? Usually it's the rich families. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have like the central bank has a committee of 12 people who kind of, you know, determine the policy. And 11 of them are just members of the Dutch rich families and uh, shareholders of corporations and so on. So it, it really is a sort of, in Europe at least, it's the upper classes uh, who are like the traditional, the traditional influencers of culture and so on. Uh, yeah, they they decide things in their own financial interest. The big corporations, for example, right, uh, and they they often have owners. You have the CEO is not really the owner. The CEO often works for the owners, right, for the shareholders. Even big companies with many shareholders, like public shareholders, even they sometimes just have an actual family who still owns the company, right? And uh, they have a, those ones, those people. They have tremendous influence on our society. And they vote basically, they want what is in their interest, not necessarily what is best for the people. I had not heard about this, but apparently Tommy Robinson was arrested. Tommy Robinson is this, uh, you know, far right uh, British fellow. He's actually Jewish, and then he wanted to join the anti Semitism march, but of course they didn't like him because he's right wing, right? Uh, he wanted to, let me see. Tommy Robinson apparently was, oh yeah, Stephen Yaxley Lennon yeah, had been asked to stay away from the anti-Semitism march. The people had warned him that his presence was likely to cause harassment, alarm, and distress to others. So apparently they arrested him. Tommy Robinson yeah, was one of the faces of the alt-right. Alt-right already sounds like ancient history, you know? Uh, alt-right... Brittany Pettibone and so on. I, I, I just forget all of them, like Gavin McInnes and all, whatnot. Those people and Milo Yiannopoulos. It's ancient history already, this movement. But the old right, I think, was a giant, gigantic psyop to lure, uh, to lure right-wing Europeans into the hands of Zionists. Yeah. Someone asks, what are your opinions on Freemasonry? Uh, it's basically an occult sect. They... What they really do is, I think, they practice secrecy. So as you move up the ranks of Freemasonry, you learn more and more about keeping your mouth shut about certain activities, right? And so they, they have these performances, a ceremony where you mock your own death, or you, they pretend to kill you, right? And then they pretend to bury you, and then they revive you, you come back to life as a brother of the brotherhood, something like that. I th my impression of all these kinds of rituals is that it's all about secrecy. This is how the elites uh, rule. They, they, they have these networks, social networks, that are just for socializing, really. But there is an added layer to it is that once you've been initiated into such a cult, you, you, have, you have been taught to keep your mouth shut about certain things. Secrecy is the key here. The secret societies are not not certain. Okay, again, secret societies are not so much about keeping themselves secret, but rather about teaching their members to keep secrets. I think that's how it really works, in my view. <clears throat> oh, someone's father has been a Freemason there. All right. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, why is Switzerland jailing homophobes? Okay. This guy apparently went to jail. Uh, let me see what it was about. This guy, Alan Sorrell, called a female Swiss journalist, a fat lesbian, and an unhinged queer activist. And for this, apparently, he was convicted of defamation and given a fine. 
Okay, and then he appealed the decision, claiming it was unjust, all right? And the state prosecutor also appealed, and so on and so forth. Right, okay, Is so apparently he went to jail for uh, calling a, a fat lesbian fat and lesbian. Don't know about that. Well, this is a bit... Uh, A bit weird. All right. Well, I'll just skip over that. I think I already discussed this. Well, I've got one more article I wanted to touch on. Sweden and the explosive consequences of multiculturalism. Uh, this guy on why Sweden's crisis of integration can no longer be ignored. Da 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 da. So what went wrong in Sweden? They allowed everybody to come in, but they made no uh, demands of anybody coming in. And you ended up having like enclaves and clans throwing grenades at each other. Sweden at some point became the the country in Europe with the most grenade explosions of all European countries. This is crazy. The nation once known for ABBA, IKEA and its social democratic welfare state has now become a byword for gangland killings and grenade attacks. Yeah, just, yeah, just like I said. Crime has soared to unprecedented levels. Grenade attacks in Sweden have become an unwelcome feature of suburban life. Islamism is spreading unchecked. Even some on the Swedish left have now been forced to acknowledge that multiculturalism is unraveling and that the state has failed to integrate vast numbers of migrants. Yeah, obviously, people coming to Europe don't come to Europe to become European. They come to Europe just for the money, for the handouts, but then they'll stay what they are. They'll stay Arab or Islamic or so on, right? And they, they have no intention to, to be one of us. This is also the great misconception of our left-wing intellectual thinkers. They think that people who want to come to Europe want to be like us because obviously we have a superior way of life. We have democracy and open borders and everybody wants democracy and open borders unless you just want to invade, right? Unless it's a form of using migration as a form of colonization. And that is what is going on. You know, Europe, European liberals are just, they get it wrong. They just don't understand what they're doing, you know, in this sense. Well, I'm going to close off talking about the news articles for a bit now. Yeah, they never assimilate. That's the real problem. Yeah. Are stores being looted and destroyed in Holland? Not to the degree, as you see elsewhere, uh, it must have happened sometimes. Yeah. Do you think the Jews are behind all of this? I don't think so. No. First of all, the Jews aren't really present in most of the world. But I do think a lot of a lot of a large number of the truly influential people in the world is overrepresented by Jewish people. That seems to be absolutely true. Uh. Immigration is invasion. That's true. Yeah, controlled immigration. Uh, if you want to subscribe to my newsletter, go to www.jmk.info. I usually send something out once a week or so to keep people in the loop about my videos or my other podcasts or activities and so on. You know, who are my favorite conspiracy theorists? Well, I don't believe in conspiracy theorists. <laughs> you could call them conspiracy realists, rather. You know, but I don't. I don't generally listen to the Alex Jones or something. In 2016, with the Trump campaign. Uh, Alex Jones became rose to stardom, right? I had never heard of Alex Jones before the mainstream media started talking about this guy. So it's not like I watch I'm I watch, you know, conspiracy theorists all the time. Oh, I do want to mention this one. There's a documentary film called American Moon. Uh, you have to look up the English version. But when you when you go, if you want to find this video on YouTube, American Moon, you won't find it because they hide it from uh, from the search results. You have to go to uh, Google and then Google American Moon English version YouTube, and then you'll find it. Yeah, Geert Wilders is probably Jewish, huh? but this this 
documentary. It's like a three and a half hour long video in English. You need to look for the English version because the original is in Italian. American Moon, but it's so good. It debunks the whole Apollo Moon program. I mean, the phrase conspiracy theorist became popular in the 1970s and 80s in the aftermath of the killing of John F. Kennedy and the Apollo moon program. And then later the phrase became in use to basically denote anybody who disagrees with the official government narrative. But don't you think this is odd? There are people who believe that the government version of every event is the true version. Aren't they really the, the real conspiracy theorists? You know? Because if you are somebody who agrees with with the government version of events in every time that something big happens, like 9-11, moon landings, JFK, right? If every time something like that happens, you you go with the version of the state, then you're just not using your brain, right? To me personally, what really changed my opinion about people was the COVID era. I found it so difficult to witness how people, people I trusted, people I looked up to, people I respected, uh, that they just ran with it. They just really believed that this was a, a new virus. We all had to get vaccinated. And I just didn't believe any of it. And it turns out uh, I was right in the end. Really? Did the Argentinian president convert to Judaism? <laughs> You know that officially, if you're a woman and if you want to convert to Judaism, officially you have to bathe in front of three rabbis. I don't think women do that, no. But don't you think that the uh, Argentinian uh, candidate, uh, the Argentinian new leader, that he was always Jewish, right? He just came out for TV, right? Don't you think? Yeah. Let's see. Malay. That's his name, right? Malay. Malay. Oh, yeah, it's right here on Bloomberg. Malay's conversion to Judaism seals pro-Israel push. <laughs> pro-Israel support. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, maybe I can put this picture on screen. I don't know if I can do that. I'm going to try to put his picture uh, on, the, on, the, on the live stream. Yeah, take care, man. Keep coming back. Let's see if I can put the picture of Malay. Malay actually converted to Judaism. I suppose he was always Jewish, right? But now he converted officially to the religion. That's how I would interpret this. It's like when Ivanka Trump came out as a Jewess. Or, no, right? She converted, so-called, right? She was always Jewish. I think the uh, Trump's ex-wife was probably Jewish anyway. So all his kids are Jews, technically, you know. Oh, man, computers sometimes make it so hard to look something up. Oh, here we go. Add source. Right. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? This is the new leader of Argentina. Here we go. <laughs> Flanked by his best friends. Cool hats, though, but, you know. Cool hats, but it's not It's not right. You I heard that Argentina is uh, the fifth nation with the most Jews in the world. So, Is there a firearm debate in Europe? No. I suppose there is. you are able to use firearms if you join a club and if you go through the whole process, all right? but you're not allowed to take the gun home. right? That's extremely rare anyway. You have to leave your gun at the club or something. Uh, yeah. No, this is not a montage. This picture, I got it from Bloomberg.com. It says in the article, it says, Malay's turn toward Judaism seals support for Israel. It's a real article. You just Google it, Malay conversion, and you'll, you'll see the article.
It's sad, you know. Why would you convert to Judaism unless you are you're already Jewish anyway, like your mom's Jewish or something, right? And why would you do this right after winning the election? And then you come out as a Jew? What kind of joke is that? <laughs> or or maybe he's he's really cynical and he thinks to himself, you know, if I play along with these Jews, I'm gonna get money, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna get a big boat, right? <laughs> maybe that's how he does it. <laughs> well, I think it's a bit over the top, yeah. Really? Okay, conversion to Judaism is a year-long thing, yeah. I believe that. Very funny, very funny. This is almost as funny as watching Arnold Schwarzenegger dance with rabbis. Uh, maybe what I can do is just play some music because I feel I can stay here for a little longer. Usually I end the stream after an hour or so, but maybe I'll just go on a little bit. But then I want to play some music in the background, just lightly, right? Let's see. Let me put on some uh, some radio here, synthwave radio. Oh, wait. The volume is always an issue when I try to play music. It's always too loud, so I'm going to... Do it way softer now. Well, maybe it's really soft for you, but uh, I'm just putting on some music a little bit. I got synthwave radio on. Uh -oh, this one can go. Anyway, Malay, yeah. That's interesting how you rise to power, you get elected, and you convert to Judaism. Yeah, sure. Oh, here, somebody asked me, you, you were going to ask me what happened to the background music. Yeah, well, yeah, I like the background music. Maybe I'll do it once in, once in a while. You know, I, I was just thinking that sometimes I want to post clips from my uh, live stream to my TikTok, and then I get in trouble with... Uh, with editing the music in the background, obviously. Hey, I saw a video of you. Please tell me why you think the European diaspora will return to Europe. Uh, I think what is happening is that uh, Europe needs people and the colonies, as I call them, they're in economic trouble. So in order to s secure the survival of our people, you need to first strengthen Europe and then we can do something back for the colonies as well. It's going to be a mutual process, but you know. You've spoken to many South Africans that want to return, but can't because of money. Yeah. And they also can't really get jobs. It's hard for someone from South Africa, even though your parents were Dutch or something, it's hard for you to just get a job in the Netherlands, even though they're throwing jobs at immigrants who come illegally. And that's just weird, you know. Thank you for answering me. I yeah, know trouble. Yeah, I'm just doing a little... Uh, I got some time to kill, so I just want to... I'm going to keep the stream going for a bit longer just to see, uh, see what ideas come up, what thoughts come up. I'm working on a new book. It's going to be called Atonement for the Sh <coughs> Sorry, <laughs> Atonement for the Shadow. And when it's finished, I will obviously promote it on my TikTok. It can take a little while. Usually, writing books, I can write it. I could potentially write a book in ten days, but then the editing process will take a whole year, and that's why book writing is such a slow process. Because when you edit the book you're writing, you want to really polish every line, right? It needs to be good. And that's the hardest part. Oh, the flag in the background, I kind of designed it. It's the Viking flag, the Viking eagle, or raven, really. It's Odin's raven from a Danish Viking flag. But the flames, I designed those myself. If you can watch it, you know. It's basically the logo for my, uh, for my podcast. That's all it really is at the moment, you know. Do we have a transgender debate in Europe? Yes, yes, obviously. It, I call it child abuse because that's what it really is. Uh, the Dutch government, media, they all support this. The academics, the leftists, everybody is pushing this transgender shit onto the children. 
who didn't ask for this. And uh, uh, it's very problematic because they, they word it in such a way as though this is good for children. And if you oppose transgenderism, you hate children. That's how they do it. They always do it like that. Uh, and it seems that normal people don't really have the arguments to go against, to go against that because they don't want to be publicly called a child hater. You know, so they just go along with it. It's very, very abusive. It's it's psychological abuse. It's next level abuse imposed with the state backing it. Basically, it's just so extreme. Uh, I'm not from Germany. I'm Dutch, but I have lived in Germany. Also, ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. I can speak German. Let them come for the kids. They're digging their own grave. Yeah. The teenagers, they don't respond well to this. Of course, there are a lot of people, young people who are confused, but the majority of the young people, they reject this trans shit. They don't want anything to do with the LGBT and so on, right? Is it true that the Northern province in the Netherlands, Groningen is basically immigrant free? Kind of, but they are moving a lot of asylum centers there, you know, and it won't stay that way. There are plans to also bring migrants to the North of the Netherlands, yeah, sadly. All right, let me see if I can think of things to talk about. Now. Our democratic governments are not democratic. They are being governed by shadow elites who have these big plans for change, global change, global progress, but they do not tell you about it. They do not inform, inform the common people. It's just really bad, you know. They want to do so much. They want to create the gender neutral society, efface the differences between men and women, raise boys and girls to be one sex, really a neutral sex, right? They want people to stop having children altogether so that they can breed people in incubation factories. It's so disgusting. Which part of the Netherlands do you think there's the least amount of immigrants? Well, in the Eastern part of the Netherlands, in the countryside. Otherwise, you will not be able to escape them anyway. They're everywhere. I'm almost monetizable on my YouTube channel, but I don't think YouTube will bring in a lot of money. <laughs> I think YouTube is dying out slowly. People moved to TikTok, right? The attention went to TikTok. So. What's the Dutch government doing to incentivize returning European ancestry people? Nothing. They're doing the opposite. They're trying to keep you out. The, the European nations, they want foreign immigrants like Muslims, Africans, and so on, Asian, Indian, but they do not want white migrants returning to Europe at all. They're trying to keep you out. They're, like I said, they want to create this mixed race, homogenous, uh, open, global open society using Europe as a starting point. Again, this is totally undemocratic. These people pushing it, they always call themselves dem democratic, but what they want to do and the way they do it is just total totalitarian imposition. It's got nothing to do with democracy. Socialist Democrats, yeah. They're in charge and they, they do do things with the people, but not for the people. You know, I just don't agree with that. It's the idea like, what's the difference between lions and termites? First of all, lions couldn't care less about termites. But what we are doing in the Western world is we're turning our societies into termite colonies where you have a few queens and so on, right? And most people will become sterile worker drones, sterile worker ants who just have to serve the, the system. But what for? 
they're really trying to transform us into termites. So it's far worse than you think it is. They don't want people to have things like freedom or independence or autonomy. They just want people to uh, be as robotic as they can be, as programmable as they can be. And then in the end, of course, if they can change us, replace you with an actual machine, you will be replaced with a machine, meaning you won't be there anymore. Nah, the, the Dutch party who won, Geert Wilders and so on, they're not going to do a Netherlands exit, no. They won't allow him to. Alright, thank you for watching. I'm going to close down now.